Welcome to the Subconscious Mind Mastery Podcast. Thomas Miller, thank you for joining us. I'm going to put a hat on today that doesn't get put on very often, but it's the old preacher hat. You know, the preacher I never became. Go back to episode number one uh, many years ago that uh, talking about going into the ministry. Well, we're going to look at a Bible chapter here. There's a great, great, great story in 1 Kings in the Old Testament, chapter 17. There's a nugget in here if you are an A-team player that is good to understand. And for a lot of people in the last several years, this kind of thing has happened. So let's dive in and talk about lessons from the brook. This is a sermon that I originally heard all the way back, literally, this would have been in the late 1970s before a lot of you were born. <laughs> and it was on a radio program by Chuck Swindoll. And God bless him as this is being recorded. The man is still going strong at 89 and just has been an inspiration to a lot of people. You might know that name. You might know exactly who I'm talking about. He has been a radio minister for many, many years, in addition to running a big church, one out here in California, and then another out there in Dallas. So I've uh, brushed shoulders with two areas where he has left his mark of ministry. Back when I was considering going into the ministry, this was one of those sermons that I just thought was wow. We're going to abbreviate things here and make it podcast style, but still there are some great lessons that we can learn. And this is also very transformational. So it ties in, I mentioned on the Fun Astrology podcast on the day that I'm recording this, that it also ties into what's going on in the sky right now. A lot of transformation, a lot of brooks drying up, as we're going to see in this lesson. So chapter 17 of the book of First Kings, quick little passage, Elijah the Tishbite from Gilead said to Ahab, who was king at that time, As the Lord God, whom I serve, lives, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next few years except by my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Kareth east of the Jordan River. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the brook east of the Jordan and stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Then, some time later, the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And that's what we're going to talk about, is when your brook dries up. Now let's just basically set the stage here. A couple of the players, Elijah was a prophet of God in the Old Testament. He was one of two people in the Old Testament that never was reported to have died. He was taken up to heaven by a chariot of fire. Many of you may have heard that story. He also was one of the ones who was supposedly pictured by the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Oh, is that Elijah as Jesus regenerated himself basically in front of them? So Elijah was even mentioned in that context of a lot of people say that's where the Bible mentions the concept of reincarnation because to the disciples it was not a surprise if somebody had come back from the past. So Elijah was a prophet. Ahab was a wicked king. He was a bad guy. He was a bad ruler. He was corrupt. Modern day politicians are not a phenomenon of political corruption. This guy was one too. So when Elijah stood before him and said, as God has commanded me to tell you, Ahab was probably checking his watch. In fact, later it talks about that Elijah was afraid of what Ahab may have done to him because of his prophecy of no rain. So Ahab could have tried to kill the guy, but at this point he probably just thought he was Looney Tune crazy. So the first scene of the play is Elijah. I mean, the curtain opens and there's Elijah and the king together. And Elijah says, God is saying that there's not going to be any rain for three and a half years. Elijah, <clears throat> yeah, right. Next, then scene two the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. 
Now, to me, see, this is where the story shifts. I mean, did this really happen, or is this metaphoric? Because, in essence, what he got was an intuitive prompt. I like to use the term connected to the home office. He got a message from the home office. He probably felt it inside. But that's the point. As a prophet, he was tuned in to his higher self. He kept that preserved. He knew the value of living his life parallel in a way that that message could come at any time, including right after you had been told to go talk to the king, and now he's given the guidance to go preserve his life, basically. Because A, there's a famine coming, by his own word, and B, Ahab is probably going to try to find him and kill him. So he goes to the brook, and there for three years he is provided by the ravens. Bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening. Not a lot of variety, but it'll keep you alive. And it's noted that he drank from the brook. Now there's a lesson in all of this, even right here. Because a lot of times in the pathways of life, we think we're supposed to be on the stage, but we're actually taken off the stage so that we can grow. It really is in those shadow times that our soul develops the most. It's when we connect with the home office. It's when we find God. It's often when our life message is hammered out, is during those quiet times. This podcast began with a story of a pastor who told me that I was his biggest disappointment in his ministry because I didn't go to seminary. I was a promising young upstart in high school in the church. And when I said that I would go be a pastor and go to seminary, oh, everybody was so happy. And I was yanked off that stage. And thank God I was. There is no way that I was ready. And rather than being some trophy up on the wall of a pastor's ministry, I had to use the Moses analogy in the Bible. Moses, when he left Egypt, was on the backside of the desert 40 years before God tapped him on the shoulder to say, go back to Pharaoh. Mine was about the same. Kind of matches my human design path, too. You'll do okay in your early years, and then you'll be quiet for about 30, and then you'll come back. And that's exactly what happened. In essence... I was by the brook. Today we live in a world, especially with all the social media and everything, where we are supposed to put ourselves out there. But a big part of our growth and development is not always about the big, oh, I manifested all this stuff for myself, and I got this position, and I'm doing all of this, and I'm only 22 years old, and all. We need time to grow. We need time to mature. So when we're out of the noise of the crowd and we're away from so many people, our peers, etc., the palace in the case of this story, Elijah left the palace and he went to the brook. That's where we go to nourish and to revive and to meditate and to do some yoga and to grow in those times when we're not on the public stage. Back to that chapter from my own life, my brook time ended in 2013 when I had a prompt in the spring to start a podcast and a prompt in the summer to email Fred Dodson about narrating his audiobooks. And all of a sudden, it's time to move in another direction. But that was right at 30 years from the time the pastor pointed his finger at me and said, you're my biggest disappointment, episode one. But our real training comes in the quiet. And another thing from the quiet, if you notice in the story here, that Elijah was provided for there by the brook, not in the public places. He was yanked off the stage, not telling people about the future, not telling them to prepare for the famine. Isn't that what a prophet's job is? No, his provision was by the brook. And boy, our society is like, this is so countercultural now, because we're not supposed to be quiet. We're supposed to be loud and proud and in charge, right? But a lot of times, our biggest provision is in the quiet places. But we often resist that, going to the closet, if you will. And yet, there are times on our path when that's exactly where we're supposed to be. And for some of you, you will look back and cherish those times that it was quiet when you're asked to step back up on the stage. Some of you will have very prominent work to be done out in the public. You'll become authors. You'll become social media influencers. 
and you'll truly long for those quiet times. And yet, that chapter of your life is now complete, and it's time to move on to the next phase. But then, in our continuing story, it says that sometime later, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Something gets taken away. We're left alone and scared. You come home one afternoon, and you find a note on the counter, and he or she is gone. Your email says you have a 10 a.m. meeting with HR. Please be there. It's very important. And your brook dries up. Doctor's office calls, and your brook dries up. Or, recently in my own life, a shift in what was secure and what you thought was there, your family situation changes. Or, another one of our listeners, who I'm very close with, recently lost a pet of over 10 years. Suddenly... Her life shifted, and her brook dried up. Or, to bring it into astrological talk, Saturn or Pluto, or both of them, transit over some sensitive point in your chart, and from the symbolism of as above, so below in your chart, your brook dries up. Inevitability of transformation, and this is built into the system, and that is so highly reflected in astrology, the nodes of the moon, Pluto, Saturn, even Neptune, the 8th and the 12th houses, all transformation. So when your brook dries up, one of the things to observe is that it is a very normal part of life. It's a part we don't like to address. It's a part we often don't like to go through, or at least we don't like to start into it. It doesn't get so bad sometimes after we're in it, but it doesn't mean that something is wrong. It doesn't mean that you're off your spiritual game. It doesn't mean that you've broken connection with the home office. It often means that you're being prepared for even greater work. We, in essence, have to be taken down in order to be taken up. And sometimes that means that something that God or Source provided is also something that God or Source takes away. Here is a little quote. I'm modifying it slightly from Chuck Swindoll's original sermon that I thought was very poignant for this part of the story. He said, For the spiritual hero to be useful as an instrument of significance, he or she must be humbled and forced to trust. In other words, he or she must be cut down to size. Or, as A.W. Tozer, an author of years gone by, said, It is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And Swindoll added, It has been my observation over the years, the deeper the hurt, the greater the usefulness. I would put that in a little bit more my terminology. That's the law of polarity right there. One of the seven laws of the universe is the law of duality, of polarity. The greater the hurt, the greater the use. The darker the tunnel, the brighter the light on the other side. People who love the scriptures often go to the book of Psalms for comfort. Many of them written by David when he was on the run. He was on the run from various sources, his family, the government, <laughs> his peers. He was often found out there on the run, hiding, trying to get away, trying to stay alive, and writing psalms in the meantime to calm his soul. One of his themes was, God has you right there in the palm of his hand. You think about a hand, a hand of comfort, holding somebody's hand at a time of when you just need that connection putting a hand around your shoulder, a strong, firm grip of somebody's hand. It's comforting. It's secure. And we can know on our path that we are right there where we're supposed to be, right in the hands of our highest path, our highest purpose. There's a story in Chuck's message where he said it was from Vance Havner's book called It's Toward Evening. Story of a group of farmers who were raising cotton in the south, and all of a sudden there was a devastating boll weevil invasion of the crops, and their entire crops were lost. It looked like they were literally headed to the poorhouse to bankruptcy. They had nothing to grow. But he said that farmers, being the determined and ingenious people that they are, decided, well, 
if we can't plant cotton, let's do peanuts. And amazingly, those peanuts brought them more money than they would have ever made raising cotton. So when the farmers realized that the what seemed like a disaster actually proved to be a boon, they erected a large, impressive monument to the boll weevil. <laughs> a monument to the very thing they thought would destroy them. Then Vance Havner said in the book, Sometimes we settle into a humdrum routine as monotonous as growing cotton year after year. Then comes the boll weevil. We are jolted out of our groove. We have to find new ways to live. Financial reverses, great bereavement, physical infirmity, loss of position. But how many have been driven by trouble to be better people and bring forth finer fruit from their souls? The best thing, Havner says, that ever happened to some of us was the coming of our bull weevil. And from my own chapters, I would say, Amen. There are other lessons you could extract from this analogy, but there's one more I'll add, and that is often also on our path. We don't get the next step until we follow the current instructions. That pattern shows up a lot, and many times we try to shortcut what and where we know we're supposed to be. Well, until we get back to where that is, it can often be a long wait because things won't move forward until we're back to that square of where we're supposed to be launching from, which is the quiet spot by the brook. And this is a pretty good analogy for any of us, that wherever we are on our path, we have to take those times to go retreat to the brook, to just be fed by the ravens, to drink the cool water, to be nourished, to revive our soul. You feed the horses from a full bucket of oats, not from an empty one. So your brook has dried. So it has. Could we reframe that to it might be the very best thing that could have happened to you? Not the worst. That just resting in the provision of what you have now will, even in the quiet stillness, lead you to where you're supposed to go next. Many of you know my story of recently moving across the country, still going through the transition, still wondering what in the world happened because I was so nestled into the brook in North Carolina. And yet, you know, inspiration came to take this offer. And I don't know what the rest of the story is, so I'm in between. I'm waiting, waiting for the next instruction. But having taken the next step, trusting that the next step will also be available at just the right time. For those of you whose brook has dried, I'm sending you a big hug. For those of you who have been by the brook and now it's time to move, it's time to go, I'm sending you the faith and the confidence to get up. It's time to move on. Plant some peanuts. Better times are ahead. And for all of us, I wish you the highest timeline path for your own soul and your own life. May you find it, follow it, and stay with it all of your days. And I have to give a special thanks to who created this little talk, Chuck Swindoll. Thank you for preaching that sermon 50-some years ago. It stuck in my ears, and it was good to revisit it again. It really is a journey. And whether you're standing before a king or sitting by the brook, enjoy that journey. I'm Thomas Miller.